Hey there, everybody. Parks Asley here with Score.gg, joined by Clayton, Captain Flowers Reigns. Welcome. Thank you so much for the interview. I appreciate it. So, I want to talk about your career. All right. You've been here. You're one of the newer faces um, for the NA scene, but you have been here a while now. Um, so three years. Three years. Two years. Is, two years. Yeah. This is the start started, of the third. Yes. Started in spring split of 2017. That was end of January 2017. So yeah, we're just past the completing the full two years, starting the third one now. Congrats on that. And Thanks, you've now sir. gotten to go. You've traveled around some. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're full fledged all the way. Uh, so I, I want to talk some about that growth. You know, just the yeah. two year growth. Um, it's something that I'm kind of touching on with pros right now. Is you know, people get traded around. It's like, what are you learning more about yourself in the new environment? You were casting for a long time before the two years, mm -hmm. but now that you've been here in a professional environment for a while, what do you feel like has been kind of the biggest growth for you? The biggest growth for me happened just from coming here and being in an environment where you have people and an entire team around you that everyone knows what they're doing and everyone knows this craft. And I mean, when I was doing the amateur scene, I wasn't a part of like big caster groups. I didn't do constant LAN events or anything like that. I didn't have other caster connections with a bunch of like aspiring amateur casters. I knew a few guys who did it as like a hobby in the same like Reddit community that I started off in. But when you look at, I know a lot of times for amateur casters and things, there's like Skype groups of people that do like all these LAN events and stuff together. Towards the end of my own amateur casting thing, I talked to Zyrene and he added me to one of those that existed. And I remember being so intimidated when I got invited to it because all these guys were talking about all these LAN things that they had done and all this other stuff. I was like, I have no idea what any of this is. I cast from my bedroom in a cornfield. <laughs> like it was, I had none of those. I had none of those supporting resources. And so to come here and be surrounded by people, uh, co-casters and managers and an entire team where they can tell you, hey, here's what I liked about that one, here's what I didn't like about the last one, where I can go in with my co-commentators before every game and say, hey, here's what I want to work on, let me know if you think I'm hitting this right, or here's what I think needs to be changed. It just creates an entire environment that's more conducive to learning and getting better. So what are the things then, like, like when you're practicing, when we look at pros, obviously they have coaches helping them, analysts helping them, teammates helping them, solo queue, and then they also have, you know, like maybe they're streaming, and maybe that, like, you know, they're just not watching the map. They're they're messing with other players or whatever. Yeah, just goofing around, having a good time. For casters, you know, you have you know you have like your support staff. Are there other times when you're also working on casting? Like in everyday life, do you try and talk quickly, or, um, or is it really just like during the week you have your practice times and then obviously on stage? I don't do any practice casting over solo queue games or anything like that anymore. That's something that I used to do a lot when I first started before I was really comfortable uploading my own videos for other people to see them. I would just commentate over solo queue, but I don't do that so much anymore. For me, a big part of it is just being creative and knowing also what's in the game. Like two, those are two completely different things. So for being creative, I always just try to think of different words, different phrases, different ways to think about and approach different situations so that when the time comes, you're not always using the same words or rehashing the same ideas in the same way that people have heard the same 100,000 times, right? I want to make sure that when you listen to me commentating something, you're listening to something at least said in a different way, something that keeps you invested. You're like, oh, I didn't think of it like that, or oh, that was a creative way to say that, or oh, what, what the hell was that phrasing? Just because it gets people invested, entertaining. That's why I started calling, like I got, we got so sick of saying the same stuff over and over, like, oh, big frontliner, big frontliner, big frontliner. So I just started joking around calling them meatballs when meatballs. you had a giant tank <laughs> in the top lane, and people responded well to that. So just creative phrasing, different ways to put things, and then always knowing the game. One thing I love to personally do is I find and spectate really good one tricks in solo queue of non-meta champions only. I don't care about people who one trick like Lissandra or Camille or something like that right now. But if you're one tricking, Vlad, if you're one tricking uh, Callista, if you're one tricking Mordekaiser, I watch them because those people will tell you everything about that champion. They will know everything about that champion. And by watching them, you discover what might bring that champion back into the meta and back into competitive play. So that is one of my favorite things to do in my own time is find high rank one tricks and watch those streams. That's really interesting. I had not thought about that. Mm -hmm. So I'll have to look at that as I look more and kind of like my ability to analyze things. Um, so what then it, kind of, how, how do you define your style? Um, and not like fast. right now, like, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, there we go, fast. Um, quick answer as well. But how do you kind of in the team 
uh, you know, with Riot along with them, how do you all work on that? Because I know, like, obviously this isn't just a, like a one-man show type of thing. Right. Um, you have to fit in with different people at different times. Um, so is that kind of, uh, you know, hey, Clayton, this was great. Uh, for tomorrow's show, we want to see you kind of, uh, you know, work on this thing or this thing. Um, or is the style really just all kind of up to you? The style's mostly up to you. It's what naturally you sort of find yourself in, for the most part, unless there's something you're specifically trying to change, right? Like for me, I've, I'm a very high energy person. I get excited very easily about something. Like I just love the, the emotional investment of competition, the emotional investment in winning and losing a game, and that shines through when I do my commentary. Like I get very excited. It's going to be a high energy thing that I'm doing. And so that's something that I practice no matter who I'm casting with, because no matter how high my energy is or no matter what I'm specifically trying to do, I'm going to go about doing that a different way with Kobe than I am with Zyrene, than I am with Azale, than I would with Jat back when he was casting with us in 2017. So you've always got to be thinking about how you're going to work with different people. And that means even more, especially in international events, because we do MSI and Worlds as the two big international events every year. You have some smaller Mimi or stuff like Rift Rivals, which isn't as big of a deal. But for the most part, the people you cast with internationally, you're getting to cast with two times a year for a few weeks at a time. When you're talking about working with Vettius or Spawn or Papa Smithy or Froskuren or anybody from these other regions. And so a lot of what that is, especially when working with them, is I always ask them specifically before we go into it, hey, how do you want to approach this? What do you think is the most important? Just try to get in their head a little bit and figure out what are they looking for in this game? What lens are they examining this game through? Because that then better lets me know how to be the Captain Flowers hype guy if Vettius is looking at this and saying, oh, well, I want to specifically look at bottom lane and I want to break down how important this is because these two players have these crazy stats. Well, that's what we're going to get hyped out. We're going to build up the bottom lanes. We're going to tell stories about these guys, right? So that's, that's one thing I always try to do is just make sure that I'm lining up what I do with how my co-commentator wants it to be told. You sound like a great duo partner. Um, so I'm, I'm not, sure that not, not on the rift. Only play Skarner. <laughs> only build. Only do Chad builds. Mute everybody else in the game. Not on the rift, but in, in real life, I do all right. <laughs> um, I'm sure everyone loves casting with you. You're definitely fun to listen to, and it's fun to see all the different dynamics that that pop up here and there. Um, so you talked, uh, you know, about like working with them. How would other people? kind of figure out their own style. Um, you know, people that are just getting into casting or people that, you know, if, if you're their kind of inspiration um, and, and they want to be a caster and they want to kind of do, you know, the casting from their bedroom in a cornfield yeah. sort of thing um, to try and make it, um, you know, kind of follow in your footsteps. What kind of advice do you have for them other than just grind it out, you know, keep your head right. straight, love, you know, you have to love it, obviously. What other like little things kind of really helped you out? So for people who are serious about it, right? That's who I'm going to be addressing this, this advice to. No memers. Yeah. No, for people who are literally looking at this and saying, hey, I want to do this. And this, doesn't just, this first point doesn't just apply to casting. It applies to anything in esports, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, whatever. A lot of people come up to me and say, hey, I love esports. I love the scene. I love the competition, the players, everything about it. I just want to be a part of it. How do I do that? And I say, okay, what do you want to do? And what they tell me is, I'm up for anything. I just, I really want to be part of esports. And I tell them that's a, that's a good answer if you're a kid in high school, you're still going through stuff, still figuring out what you want to do, and this is an aspiration. I will not take anyone seriously who tells me that as an answer because that just lets me know this is still in the pipe dream phase for you. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is find what you're really passionate about, whether it's production, graphic design, interviewing, hosting, casting, whatever. Find what you really want and go all in on that. Because why on earth would I pick you, the guy who just wants to get in esports, bro, when I could pick Jimmy McGraphic Designer, who <laughs> loves graphic design and this is his thing and he's got ideas and all sorts of solutions and he's been thinking about stuff and graphic design is what he does to be my graphic designer. Yeah, you love esports, but this guy does too and he also loves graphic design. Mm -hmm. Same thing with casting. And for casting, it's more of a thing because you have a play-by-play -play casting role and a color commentary casting role. And that's always the first thing I tell people is pick which one of those you want to do. And oftentimes they'll say, which one should I do? 
And I say, you do the one that you're passionate about. I say, if you want to tell the stories of players and teams and you want to get excited in the action and really bring people into those visceral moments, do play by play. If you want to analyze and break everything down and explain to people not just what's going on, but why it's happening and really get in the heads of the players and the coaches and the teams and just share that wealth of knowledge with people, be a color commentator. But don't come in and tell me that you're just going to do whatever, whatever there's a spot for because that's not a good answer. And that's the foundation that we build the house on. And then everything else just comes down to there's a lot of practice about it, right? Like you've got to rewatch your own stuff. That is the most important thing I can tell people. I never, never let anybody hear a single cast that I did till about a month and a half after starting. And I would just watch them back over and over and over on videos, see what I like, see what I don't like. It's just like what people say when you're writing a, a report in school and read it back out when you're done, read it out loud to see how it sounds. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to notice something when you go back over it that you didn't notice while you were doing it. And you might think, oh, well, I didn't realize I said the word initiation as a crutch so much. I've got to think of a different way to word this. Or, oh man, whenever this happens, I always switch the names of Anivia's Q and her E. I got to make sure that I get that vocabulary down right whenever I cast this champion, right? There's a lot of things that you're going to notice that you will not notice without review. And if you have regular casting partners, if you have somebody that you're frequently working with, do the review as a duo if you can. Because then maybe I don't know some, notice something or maybe something doesn't register to me as something that I would want to change. But my co-caster says, oh yeah, the way that you set these up is okay, but I feel like it would transition better if you used this to set me up or something like that, right? Think not just about yourself, but about the cast as a whole, because you are a part of it. You are not the whole thing. And so always be reviewing, always be self-critiquing. Even if you become the best there is, you still have an obligation to be better than you previously were. Do you, would you recommend, if, if someone were really serious about this, trying to find a duo? and finding someone who they could kind of work with on it? Or do you think it's better to do solo and just figure it out that way? A lot of people go for duos. I knew a lot of people who did back in the day. I did not because the thing is about the amateur scene, for a lot of people it is a hobby. For a lot of people it is just something they're trying out. And for a lot of people there's not a permanence to it. Once you get to the level, if you at least have like a regular gig, then I think that would be where I would say start looking for a regular commentating partner, whether it's someone that you met through this regular league thing you have, like let's say you're casting a high school league or something like that, and they say, hey, you're going to be the play-by-play, -play. here's Jimmy, he's going to be your color commentator. Well, then, yeah, you're going to work with Jimmy a lot, right? Or maybe you go into a thing, now you and Jimmy get done casting this high school league, and you're like, hey, I think we really build up a good team together. If you're serious about doing further casting stuff, I saw a couple other things we might be able to get into. Do you want to continue to be partners and go from there? But when you're just starting out, you're like jumping around for different opportunities, maybe cast a couple games for a Reddit league here or do like a private in-house league over here for a, few, for a few weeks. I wouldn't personally invest in a long time duo in those because a lot of times people aren't long term. Mm -hmm. Wait till you hit a semi-serious environment and find someone who you think is going to be just as serious as you are because that's how you're going to find someone who will better you instead of potentially drag you down. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a, a great answer. Um, I think very helpful information. Um, and how does, how does Riot kind of do the scouting? Because we know scouting pros, like we had scouting grounds. Mm -hmm. So where's the, you know, are, are we going to bring little Caster scouting grounds, little Captain Flower uh, imitators up for the next <laughs> scouting grounds, you know? Um, like what, what ways kind of, you know, should people be marketing themselves is the real question. Do everything you can. There is nothing too small. The very first thing I ever casted was a random tournament off the forums that forgot they didn't get a caster 20 minutes before it started, and I commented on their post and said, I'll do it. It had eight viewers. Five of them were the guys putting it on. That was the first thing I ever did. You just have to go do anything you can to build your portfolio and get your name out there because amateur esports for pretty much anything is a trench. It is a long, messy road that it is a pain in the butt to get through, and nobody gets through it easily. You can get through it easier than others if you have connections, if you have some previous experience or whatever, but for me, I started out with none of that. And you have to be willing to grind through it. I know you said earlier, don't just tell me the answer to grind, so I wanna make sure I elaborate on this, but there's no set path for becoming a pro commentator. There was none when I started either. And it's actually a lot better in the current environment than it used to be. But I just started off casting anything I could. And there were some days I had no idea if I was doing the right thing, man. I 
could not tell you if I was on the right track or not. I just kept casting, kept grinding, kept doing every event that I could. And then I eventually had a play that came from one of the amateur leagues that I casted that hit the top of the League of Legends subreddit. And the day after that happened, Riot Games sent me an email and said, hey, we like that call, let's talk. And that started a nine month interview process that I had with them, over which time I started. And once you get, if Riot does address you, if somebody does say, hey, I think your casting's pretty good, that's not a sign that you made it. Now's the time where you can, <laughs> now's the time where you're like playing the real game. You're still in the prologue until you're signed onto a contract. That's when I started, after Riot started talking to me, was when I started doing bootleg casts from the Chinese regions. That's when I started doing cast of solo queue pros playing boot camp in Korea before Worlds. That's when I started doing both open qualifiers for different regions, just finding anything I could to let Riot know, hey, now that you got eyes on me, here's how serious I am. And that's what you've got to be able to do because there's not a lot of opportunity. There's not a lot of openings. When you look at how many professional English casters there are for the tier one regions in competitive League of Legends for the English speaking language, there's under 30. I don't know what the exact number is, but the last time I checked, it's somewhere between 20 and 30. That's not a lot of people for a global audience. So those openings are few and far between. And when they open up, there's no advice I can give you or anybody else out there to say, oh, well, here's how you get in. Here's how you make Riot notice you, because that doesn't happen. What I can tell you is that when an opportunity shows up, you better be there with a whole box of your accolades, your accomplishments, your highlights, so that you are the shiniest diamond in the whole damn crowd <laughs> that people can look out and say, ooh, that caught my eye. Let me look into that a little bit more because that's, that's what you can actually change. You don't worry about the things we, you can't change. You don't worry about the fact that there's currently no open job posting for shoutcasting. You worry about making sure when there is one, you are ready. I love that answer. Thank you. Before we go, I know we're kind of running out of time here. I'm curious if you have any kind of highlights of your career, any like things that you've slipped out, you know, you're always talking about experimenting with uh, phrases, <laughs> anything that you want to say, uh, that you want to like call out on that. I, the play got recycled so much last year because it was so insanely hyped. The KT versus IG base race from Worlds 2018 with me, Papa Smithy, and Kobe, where afterwards I couldn't even breathe because it was just a minute straight and ended up with a single auto attack deciding the fate of the game. Those are the kinds of moments that just, they never leave you. Same thing for Worlds 2017 when EDG had a 10,000 gold lead over SKT, and then Rakan initiates and Faker's shockwave on top of the Rakan hits everyone, and you know the team fight's over because you see all those red health bars. Those kinds of moments, that's why I'm in esports, and those are what I love, those huge defining ones, and that's what it's all about, man. That's what it's all about. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the interview. Thank you very much thanks, for having Thanks me for on. the advice. I hope you all found that helpful. And, you know, keep going. Chase your dreams. Grind. And find Follow some fun heart. in it. Follow, Follow your, your heart. heart. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching. I'll catch you next time. Peace.